G'day everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Australian Property Investment Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Christie David, and if you, if you don't know me, I run a mortgage broken business called Atelier Wealth, where we help property investors start out and scale up their portfolios. Uh, as part of any investor's journey, it's, uh, it's talking to people who have been there, done that, or what I call who are best in breed. So these are thought leaders in our industry, people that are giving back, people that are trying to see investors do well and prosper and quite often that comes from a place of um, their hearts in the right place and they want to reach more investors and today someone's very very knowledgeable about the not only the invest property investment market data but also kind of what goes on behind the scenes from a media and a communications perspective as well having run one of the big titles in this space as well um, if you don't know right house advisory you're probably not on youtube um <laughs> <laughs> Jacob has an incredible presence on there. Jacob Field, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you for having me, Aaron. It's an absolute pleasure and a privilege. And um, I've been looking forward to it, even though I've, I've come down with a cold today in the last 24 hours, so I might not be my bubbly self. I'll push through. <laughs> Mate, push through, you shall. Uh, and I really appreciate, I, I appreciate you, you showing up the way that you do, um, you know, honouring a commitment and, uh, and doing you're doing so not. Um, it can knock you about, right? Just even if it's a, we call it a little cold, but... Made it messes with your head and um, don't show up how you, how you want to sometimes. Mate. So thank you very much. It's my pleasure. I wouldn't have missed it. I was really looking forward to coming on and having a conversation about uh, property, but then also obviously with your finance and strategy background, that's a, a common issue that I see a lot today is uh, finance. This is a game of finance that we play. So picking your brain, uh, maybe sort of comparing notes in a few ways, I think it's uh, – I'm really looking forward to it. So Beautiful. Uh, I just want to start – uh, chat by saying this is general in nature and not intended to give advice. So if you do need uh, advice, please seek out a qualified expert, pay for that advice and find the right person that's going to suit your needs as well. Yeah. So like I mentioned, Jacob Field runs a business called Right House Advisory and we'll talk a little bit more later about what Right House stands for and what they do. Um, but Jacob has, I mean, we're talking about uh, years of skin in the game for investing in property I mean, you've built your own portfolio, for example, but you've also had the privilege of running Australian Property Investor Magazine, which I think is a very unique perspective because you kind of reported on what was going on on the ground. Um, that was an incredible title that really, I guess, fueled yeah. investors seeking out that knowledge as well. I mean, the amount of info that used to be on in, you know, the, the back pages with every property, <laughs> every suburb, uh, it was, I mean, that's a, that's a beast to be managing as well, mate. So well done to you. And really now your iteration is helping uh, helping property investors you know, build and build and grow quality portfolios, mate. Yeah, it is. Would you like me to give a little bit of background about how those things come together? Because connecting those dots is sometimes important, Aaron, and um, giving a little bit of context behind it. But I do blabber on a little bit about myself. So hopefully nah, that's what I call them three, me. So three Ps are a bit about yourself, personally, professionally, and property. I think you, you kind of can touch across all three. Yeah. Um, look, I'm from Tasmania originally, and I'm, I'm calling in today from Coles Bay up here on the East Coast. Um, yeah. A beautiful part of the world, but, you know, it is a smaller island and a smaller place. So as a lot of Tasmanians did, uh, mid-20s, we're all jumping on a boat or jumping on a plane <laughs> and, and escaping to the mainland, we called it. <laughs> um, I've got two beautiful children with my wife, Anna, uh, a 10 and a, and a seven-year-old, and they're not in and around property yet, you know, I'm, I'm try, trying well, to start. Not yet. <laughs> one day, one day. I guess, you know, I, I think it now as sort of time goes on um, and I'm getting older, I used to be very sporty, but I spend a lot of time with my children now and, and you know, seeing them grow and, and develop, it's it's really wonderful to do. So, um, look, for me, down here in Tassie, things, I guess they're a little bit tough to start with. Um, I was living with my dad and he was on the sole parent pension and we didn't have a huge amount to go around. Um, so from a probably early age, I had this, uh, you know, focus on changing our loss in life or, you know, pulling ourselves out of where we were. And it probably wasn't really normal for a 10 or a 12 year old to be sort of <laughs> focusing and doing the things that I was doing. But really, I, I wanted to try and look for a different way, um, not be reliant, obviously, on the pension mm. as dad was. Um, so, you know, things like um, Jan Summers, uh, More yeah. Wealth from Residential Property, was a, a book that I read when I was sort of 14 or 15 of my own volition. And it really sort of turned my eyes towards uh, how property investment could work. 
um, and how we could use other people's money. And I think that was that was the big aha moment for me. So property investment was the means that I used to start investing. And there were a few false starts. Uh, I bought my first investment property when I was 21 down here in Tasmania. Uh, it probably would have been earlier if it wasn't for dad who, you know, dad on the sole parent pension had a, a real sort of aversion to risk. So he talked me yeah. out of, you know, getting a loan of any type and I yeah. didn't buy a property when I turned out and I actually bought a sports car in from Japan without seeing it, <laughs> which he didn't think was as risky. <laughs> so that came out here and uh, I couldn't insure the car. And so I thought, well, I'm not listening to you again, dad. I sold the car and bought a property. Um, it did really well for us. I, I think as luck would have it down here in Hobart around that sort of 2005, 2004, we had some pretty crazy capital growth, similar times to what it is now. Uh, and I thought, well, this is working well. Bought another property soon after. Um, and then I lost my way a little bit, Aaron, to tell you the truth. I, I was sort of in my early to mid-20s. So I was burning the candle at both ends, you know, at uni, uh, spending a lot of time with friends and things as you do. And I lost lost sight of things. I, you know, I thought... You know, I've achieved what I wanted to do. I've got two investment properties now. Um, you know, I've ticked all these boxes and I've started living the life too early, I guess. Mm. Um, and reality gave me a kick up the bum. I guess it wasn't until I met Anna when I was 25, 26, when she really sort of brought that focus back into things for us. Uh, she convinced me to move to the mainland, to move to Sydney. Um, I wanted to continue to investing. You know, we both moved into jobs there. Um, yeah. And, and, which we wanted to continue investing and I went and had a look at some properties, had some friends in property that I'd met online, uh, yeah. quite well-known people, I guess, in the industry now. And they told me Mount Druitt, Western suburbs, went out to Mount Druitt and completely lost my confidence, Aaron. It really did throw mm. me and, and it wasn't really like what I'd seen down here in Hobart in terms of investing. Yeah. Um, and that's where I went to probably back to where I knew and what I knew best is, is software engineering, research, data. Uh, Dad bought me. A computer, that's really all he spent our money on when I was younger on a computer. That's what he was into. So I had a computer, but we didn't really have much else. Uh, so I've always been into software engineering and programming, and um, I went back to that. That's that's how I got my confidence back, uh, you know, after being thrown a little bit moving to, to Sydney and, and and seeing what was around. Um, yeah. And it wasn't a, another two years before Anna and I purchased our next property. Uh, it was up towards the Maitland area. Um and that was a full process. You know, we'd go out to breakfast and lunch every day to a different suburb on the weekends for two years, getting to know, I guess, how people lived, why they lived there, mm. why they paid what they did. And then I went back and looked at the data for the rest of the week and tried to find those matches. And uh, that's when the algorithms and things started, that, the first evolution of it. Wow. Um, obviously, went on to, to buy again. And I'm aware of time, Aaron. I'll keep it short. Time. Time. Went on to, to buy again. We, we, we did develop a portfolio across the country. Uh, we went into many different strategies without really a reason to. <laughs> so there's a lot of mistakes along the way, which I'd, I'd love to talk you through. That's probably the key learnings. Um, and then property investment, it, it did really work for us. You know, finance was a very different game for us back then when we were yeah. buying. So um, with our incomes and things, we could essentially just keep buying um, as, as quickly as we had the deposits, uh, which were quite low. You didn't need a 20% deposit in a lot of cases then. So um, we continued buying. We got to the point where we were 30, uh, early 30s, and we were able to leave our jobs. Um, we were able to move back down here to Tassie uh, to be closer to grandchildren after we'd had our first child and, and to change things there. Um, we were sort of living in middle Sydney in Lane Cove area, and it was a great area, but it was, you know, it was difficult to uh, get out and do things on the weekend. Yeah. So we wanted to make those lifestyle changes. Um Along the way, you know, property allowed me, the positive impact of property, it allowed me to have those, you know, make those decisions and to take that uh, time away from a job and not be reliant on it. And mm -hmm. it also then gave us the time to turn that framework, what I was been working on, uh, to, buy, to buy our own properties into software that other people could use. So 2011 uh, was the first year that we actually released our software and research to others. Uh, and then since then, I've obviously been a professional in the industry. Um, and working working with others. Um, yeah, some of the highlights though, you know, 2016, 2017, I was lucky enough to buy Australian Poppy Investor magazine. Uh, it, that's a magazine that I did grow up reading. Uh, yeah. It was a privilege to, you know, as you say, I'd sort of rushed out of the news agency in those days and have you got it in, have you got it in? And you'd rush away to a cafe and read it and you'd turn to the back of the books and see how much money you'd made last month and, you know, <laughs> In the, in the in terms of the suburb growth, that was really the only source of it, wasn't it, Aaron? Like yeah, you didn't it? have 
data in other places. It was in the back of the magazines, and um, it was a true privilege to be able to take that that magazine on and and course correct. You know, they they were too slow potentially going into the tech space. Mm. Um, there were some opportunities there. They were very, uh, you know, I guess old school in how the business was structured. Uh, and the problem I saw with the industry, Aaron, uh, it still exists to a certain degree is it's pay for play. You know, if you pay the most for advertising, you'll get the most airtime in these magazines. So uh, we made it a meritocracy. We basically uh, threw the keys back to the audit authors. Um, the faster the, the articles were liked or shared, then we'll show them more airtime. You know, a, a pay for play article might get 100 views or it might get, you know, 10,000 in the space of a, a week or so. Yeah. Um, and that really worked. You know, traffic went through the roof. Uh, we built it back up again uh, into an online publication. And then I was tapped on the shoulder by a Singaporean company to actually purchase it about 18 months later. Wow. Um, they, yeah, they had plans to obviously come back into Australia. They weren't well known here as a brand uh, and they wanted to, 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 to have API in their stable. So that was a, a good sort of transition, you know, and um, yeah. back into Ripe House Advisory, which has been the commonality. Um, it, it does bring together my software background, research background, property, and then working with other investors is, um, is what sort of makes it worthwhile. <laughs> um, seeing the results and, and how you can actually change people's trajectories is, is very rewarding. So... I think that's full circle, Aaron. I've been talking. Circle. Yeah, I think I, I <laughs> you haven't fallen that. asleep, so it's good. <laughs> no, I, I will continue that because you mentioned a couple of things, and one is you learned a lot going through your journey as an investor yourself. Mm. Get me through. Is obviously the wins where where properties have performed and you bear with leverage and, and then go again. And but I find that a lot of us learn from what didn't work as well. So learn from my mistakes is something I say a lot to people. Um, what were some of the now? learnings but at the time mm. maybe mistakes that you made as well Jacob. well if only we could learn from other people's mistakes that would be <laughs> <laughs> that would be really good so i can yeah. tell you about what we did but it's probably not going to stop many people from making the same mistakes again and um and I, so I, i'll talk about my mistakes but then i'll talk about potentially the strategy of how we can stop doing it which i yeah. see very common in the industry you know um i am very close to, to a uh in the different channels and the different businesses that I'm involved in, I am very close to investors and I, and I take a lot of pride in that. Yeah. Um, so I see the issues. I see the same things that people are, are knocking their head up against the wall with, you know, day in and day out. But, you know, a high level, you know, we've had a, a conversation in the past, Aaron, where I see finance. This is a game of finance and particularly important right now as opposed to when I was buying a lot of my properties where they didn't have serviceability rates in the same way or DTI ratios in the same way. That's probably the big one. APRA was, I didn't even hear of APRA yeah. until sort of eight years ago or whenever it was. Um, think of things that we're trying to get as much forward progression towards our goals as possible. You know, we're here and we want to get to the future. We want to get and achieve our goals. And that could be an equity goal or a cash flow goal. You know, the more we go to the left and the right, the slower our forward progression is. You know, we're not taking the path of least resistance. So, you know, I made mistakes where what I mean by the left and the right is, you go too far over to the left here, you might be chasing cash flow in a deal. You know, you might be chasing this regional property that doesn't grow in value or a mining town that goes bust or a commercial asset uh, that has great incomes but not particularly the growth. Um, if you go too far to that left, the banks love you. Uh, they love your servicing. They love your income. But you're not saving those deposits up, so it might slow that for progression. So on that left-hand side, I made a few mistakes. You know, I went into regionals, back of the, the, back of the magazine once again, my data was telling me all these wonderful things. Went into places like Dubbo. Um, mm-hmm. And when I went into Dubbo, I didn't buy where I should have bought in, in potentially the, the middle to upper socio areas in a small town. I bought the lower socio chasing the yields and hoping it would turn around. So, you know, buying re, re, um, residential properties with 10 or 12% yield on purchase and then, you know, the streets that they were in brought with it their own um, socio issues, you know, their own... Um, problems with residents and neighbours. And I, I guess it, it causes a lot of stress in our portfolio. When you're managing your portfolio, um, you know, you know and, and I don't need to go into, into details, but you're managing a number of these properties in your portfolio. Um, when you get these phone calls, they start happening more and more often when you go into these types of places where the numbers might be good, but the emotional stability mm-hmm. or the stress associated with them just does not justify it. Um, you know, so we'd get phone calls or one in particular on a Sunday afternoon and it was from the Dubbo area code and um, it's 
<laughs> you know, my heart sank when I got the phone number, the phone call because I knew something was wrong. And, um, you know, thankfully, you know, it's a very unfortunate situation, but thankfully it wasn't our property. But the next door ha- neighbor's property had burnt down. They didn't know who had done it. Yeah. Uh, and this was happening all in and around. So yeah. you can go after, you know, cash flow, but then it's at the expense sometimes of growth, you know. Okay. We have pretty standardized minimum rentals in Australia. And I don't say this in the wrong way because of, you know, social housing and social assistance and pensions and things like that. So we have a floor in rentals, but values can really drop through the floor. And if there's no value growth there, then values stay low for a long time. The yields might be attractive, but it brings with it a whole other raft of issues. So okay. that was one of the mistakes there. Probably on the other side You're of like, the equation. Just sorry, on that point, sorry. On that point, nothing frustrates an investor more than having the ability to borrow but not having the equity or the cash to then go. It's one of the ultimate frustrations uh, is what I see, especially from a finance perspective. They've got the means. They've got the borrowing capacity. They've got the want, but now they just don't have the equity or the cash to then go again. It stifles their, their growth, doesn't it? And, and you, it, it's frustrating, you, you know, and it, it's in, especially for me when I was really trying to get ahead, it was very frustrating. And you bury yourself into a hole where, yeah. you're, you know, you're beholden to your portfolio. It becomes a, a noose around your neck. And it's, yeah. and you sit there day after day thinking, well, hang on, how can I take course corrective action? You know, how can I get back towards the middle? Um you know, that wasn't even the start of it. You know, I'll do things as well, Aaron, where we'd, you know, buy properties within sort of two or three hours of Sydney, which is where we're living. You know, we'd knock off work at lunchtime on a Friday to go to Ikea to pick up a full kitchen on the back of a trailer, drive, put the kitchen in over a weekend and get back to work on a Monday. Yeah. You know, so we'd be doing these things where we were refining this strategy. We're testing around the edges what was working and what wasn't. And we worked out there has to be certain criteria with the population centre, not rural, rural. There had mm. to be a certain diversity. There had to be a certain proximity to a larger pro- you know, population centre. And then value adding was when it started really clicking for us, um, yeah. buying properties and hoping or buying properties <laughs> that had little opportunity to value add. That's what gets you out the back door, you know, being able to sh- take those short circuits, um, potentially finding good yielding properties, value adding, gets you back over to the deposit for the next one. Um, that kitchen, by the way, from Ikea, I put that on a credit card, like literally paid for the kitchen on a credit card, put it in myself, um, and then as soon as I could, refinance, paid the credit card off, and then access the equity to to go again. You know, that was the game. Um, probably went too far over to the other side. So I was a rent investor is the term these days. Um, mm-hmm. It wasn't until our sixth property that we purchased that we actually live in. You know, so we were living the lifestyle that we wanted with our children, uh, we were in sort of the Darlinghurst, Rush Cutters Bay area of Sydney and uh, investing in the areas across the country that were giving us the returns that we wanted, right, which were other areas. And, yeah. and I can talk more on that as a, as a science, I guess, in, the, in, in a moment. But um, went too far the other direction. You know, buying too early in the Sydney market without the yield there, it was great for the equity production. It was great for the deposits. Going too far over to the right, though, we didn't have this, the, the income attached to those investments and the banks said, no, thank you. <laughs> That's enough. Uh, you know, so we stay in that course correct. I'll be sort of oscillating between over here, over here, um, bought another site that was a development site, which looked great on paper. Um, but then development sites, you're paying for a lot of land that doesn't have a, a yield attached to it, doesn't have an income attached to it. So the yield on that then was another noose around my neck for a couple of years. So, um, yeah, I've sort of done a few different things, but it, it was always a battle of that left and right. <laughs> and so... I guess as an evolution of that, the the properties that I've focused on in the last few years and particularly with clients, um, having a very clear purpose for why we're buying them, what what we're actually trying to achieve from this property and having that awareness of is this income at the expense of deposits or equity production at the expense of income and what are the costs associated with those trade-offs? That's probably the learning. Mate, well said, and it is spot on. The strategy then, you know, meets the finance strategy, meets the, what, what the goal is to buy the next property, build a portfolio, and exactly what you said about being a rent investor. I feel like rent investing has its place up until the point that you get married or you want to put down roots, for example, which is have a family, then you know, have that stability. Um, and I feel like that's where the topic of rent investing probably has its has its place to go. It's great and it'll get you to a certain point, but what happens at this next stage? And I feel like a lot of people have been on the rent investing journey up until now where they've maybe grown up a little bit more going, now we're thinking about family or having kids. It's like we actually want to buy our own place. 
and it's it's got them to here, but it won't get them to there. Yeah, and, and even when they do that, though, you know, I have a very s- separate strategy for principal place of residences. You know, it's it's buying really low into a very blue chip market and doing you know overcapitalizing. You know, it might sound crazy, but you can't really o- overcapitalize on a core owner occupier. Uh, lead assets in a very yeah. blue market and you don't pay capital gains tax on that. So even personally in the owner occupier space, I have a different strategy where I the, the rules are off the table, you know, and mm. Hobart's a smaller place. So it's not like Sydney where you're sort of moving from one suburb to the next and aspirational suburbs. Now it's almost in Hobart, like street to street. Um, yeah. you know, but buying that unrenovated home and then putting the crazy bedrooms on there, putting the pool in there and then, mm. you know, targeting an owner occupier buyer, starting again, you know, moving That's through the ladder that way in the owner occupier space is something that's a, an entirely different strategy. But um, yeah. But wait, mate, let's, get, let's look through the lens of uh, ripe house advisory, right? And I want you to, in your own words, explain what the, what the premise is behind it, what people get when they come to ripe house and how you've been able to help investors as well. It's, um, it's a good question and, and probably just pulling back a little bit, you know, so I, I left my job. Um, the software had been there in the background, right? So I was always thinking away. Um, yeah. Even while I was working, my heart was somewhere else. So developing the software over 18 or so months before I left the job and then decided to give it a, a go um, full time, you know, in, in between kids and babies and things. So my <laughs> house as a software started as a software and as a service. You know, it was you come onto the website and you pay money, you know, $97 a month to use the subscription. Um, about 2015, 2016, I was thinking, wow, this is doing great. Uh, a lot of people were contacting us and saying, thank you, I couldn't have bought this property without you. The research is excellent. Wonderful. So I took a bit of a deep dive. I'm not saying that in a positive way. I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm, there's, a, there's a point to that. We took a deep dive into the actual properties that people were purchasing. And um, you know, we had over 1,000 people who were using the software at that point, Aaron. And I was thinking, this is great. This is really working. But it was two thirds of the properties people were buying in a research assisted fashion were yeah. incorrect, right? So you'd say, hey, go and buy here in, uh, you know, Sunshine Coast in uh, Warana. And they'd think close enough is good enough and just go next door and buy in the Stocklands estate or they'd buy a unit there near the beach thinking it's all they could afford. They've got the suburb right. Or, uh, you know, they might buy just around the corner of the sweet spot in the area and there's a bit too much public housing there or they might not negotiate effectively. So, um, that audit of you know many purchases where the mm-hmm. investor had thought, hey, I've done this great job, where when you look at it from a professional lens, there were compromises to it, um, caused concern. You know, Anna and I were looking at it going, do we continue evolving this software? Do we continue to improve upon it? Or is literally the packaging of this research just entirely incorrect? Um, so we started investigations with other buyers agents, other professionals in the industry. So people you pay as an investor to do the research yeah. and to find properties for you. Yeah. Um, uh, that led to a whole other raft of problems, I guess, where I, I didn't want to empower a buyer's agent who was just focused on their local turf. I truly believed in buyer's agents being borderless. Yeah. Um, you know, you find buyer's agents, if they're sitting there on the North Shore of Sydney, they're only going to recommend the North Shore of Sydney as an investment where you know, someone who's a little bit too far to the right wants some, you know, needs income, they might not be the best investment place for them mm. at the moment. So there's a bias there with buyers agents in some cases. So I didn't want to perpetuate that bias. So what we looked at doing was providing a layer of research and due diligence to other buyers agents. Um, that was really successful. You know, we went through to, to COVID. Essentially, we had over 70 buyers agents in the country that had uh, outsourced their research due diligence. You know, their client would walk in the door in Sydney um, they'd take the brief from the client and then behind the scenes, they would outsource the property selection, uh, the right. due diligence, the individual areas to us, and then would even do in our own reporting, which was fully white label to the business. They'd click a button, they'd get it all and would even start negotiating. We'd talk to the agents. We were making hundreds of phone calls a day, talking yeah. to real estate agents, and that was working. Well, for me to see if it's working um, from a data perspective is, is the research or the value of that research um, passed across to the investor and how often is that passed across? If it's 90%, 95%, great. If it's 30%, not good enough. Mm. And that model was working. Um, 
at one point as well, you know, we were we were buying a lot of properties. You know, I, we, I did the numbers at, at going into COVID and it was over 1% of every dwelling purchase in Australia. We were uh, responsible for actually selecting and then passing it to the buyer's agent. Um, it was it was crazy, the number of properties we were buying and, and it really did allow us to throw our weight around in, when we're coming into markets. We had a tremendous amount of leverage. Um but what we gave these buyers agent businesses was scale. You know, would have a, a, a couple, uh, um, you know, two of them in a business, and they might be working on thirty clients a month. You know, based on us being able to do that for them, and um, it was working. But then COVID happened, and I'm going into another long story, Aaron. But COVID happened very quickly. The, the buyers agents didn't need scale. They didn't have clients knocking on the door. They didn't need our services. We looked mm-hmm. at what was working, what wasn't working. Um, and then once again, there are a lot of very junior buyers agents in the industry. Uh, we had a couple of them, you know, use our services with their first clients. And then when they were making offers, they actually asked us to help them fill in the purchase contract because I'd never done it before, right? Yeah. And so uh, we were thinking, hang on a second, what are we actually doing again? So that caused me to go back to is the research being projected and the results from that research being passed over to the investor? And at that point, coming out of COVID, we made a decision to work directly with clients. Um, and it is a, uh, you know, we don't try and solve problems in a traditional way. You know, there's, there's over 40 people in the business now and um, we have a separate research department. We have a separate uh, due diligence department and we have a separate client management or buyer's agent awesome. department who yeah. are doing the negotiations. And so that's the final uh, I guess completion of the circle. It's working more in a direct fashion. Um, we still work with a few buyers agents, some of the good buyers, um, but otherwise we, we have to keep the research very close to our chest. So, um, yeah. yeah, I love the fact that you've been quite protective of the tool and making sure it's being used in the right direction, as opposed to going mainstream or commercial and just going right commoditize it, as opposed to let's protect our IP and make sure it's actually going to the, the right hands. And being used correctly as well, so it's quite a um, a genuine type approach, isn't it? To like look, it's you, you have to like, and, and it's it's actually an issue that I'm seeing in a major way at the moment, and it's becoming people are not really stopping to think. And I'm not saying this in a way of, of judging, but I'm saying mm-hmm. this in my observations. Um, people are very quick to to latch onto a suburb recommendation. Oh, you know, at the moment, people might be recommending Toowoomba. Yeah. You know, so they're very quick to go Toowoomba, Toowoomba, Toowoomba. If you guys are talking about it, I'm going to jump out and I'm going to go there, right? So I call that, a, you know, public advisory or public sources of information and it's the masses, right? There's a lot of people diving over that data. I'll give you a little bit of an idea of, of the other side of the equation because for me, the data and the research is worth more to less people or it's worth less to more people. If you're the first into a market and you know there's going to be quite a few people following you, then, you know, you'll be buying all the development sites, you'll be, you know, buying some commercial dwellings and you're getting, you know, doing, getting all the best deals. The second person, the second best deals and so on up through the tree. And and this is something that I really grasped with owning Australian Property Investor Magazine. One of the reasons why I actually bought that was because I was in control of the public advisory to a certain degree in the industry. Um, you know, we do this now and we did it in Toowoomba. We, we bought 120 properties in Toowoomba last year and we don't rely on, external sources of research. If it's in a research report, we almost might not buy there. If it's talked about in an education course or a company or a score or whatever it might be, it means that it's probably too late for us. Mm. Um, when you get in first and you don't rely on any of those sources of research, um, you're able to get the best deals. And the more people who know about that information, then the less the quality of the deals. You start having people offer over offer scenarios. Yeah, um, it's, it's scary because it's, it's close enough is not good enough. You know, and it's particularly in times like this, an entry point that might be five or seven percent above what someone has purchased there two or three months before, that's the difference between actually having equity in your property in a year's time or not. You know, we're, we're hitting the top of the cycle potentially in a macro space. So um, we can't just think close enough is good enough and you know, I'll pick the area that's that's fine, thanks. Um, you know, I'll get off my high horse. <laughs> ah, let's, let's stay there because my one of my other questions I've got for you is this is typical what happens. I've heard it from a YouTube video. I've heard it from media reports. Uh, and we'll pick on Toowoomba for no real reason that you've just mentioned it yet. So I've heard it a couple of times. And then it's now you're looking for the reasons to buy there. And it's what I call a confirmation bias. And you'd be very, you'd be very aware of that. Um, so it's like... It, 
alters our perspective going, oh, okay, so this is the space to be buying in and now you're looking for all the reasons to be buying there as opposed to maybe you're overlooking the reasons why it may be overheated or hasn't got the right yields, for example, but you insist on this is the area for me. So take me through, uh, how have you seen or have you been able to combat confirmation bias or how do you address that even with your own bias that you're, you're advising as well, Jacob? Um, as a business, we don't ever talk about the locations we're buying in. So a client would come to us and they're like, you know, let's have a chat. I love what you do. Um, can you talk to me about some of the locations we're buying in? No, we can't. You know, we can give you a, maybe Queensland or WA. We can't really dig in any deeper than that because we have to lock that information down as tightly as possible. And I'll, I'll give you an idea of how well coordinated this needs to be. Um, and I have a bit of a, a case study, you know, it only takes a minute or so, but um, going into COVID, when we're buying properties for, for clients and for clients of clients, um, we had a lot of leverage, right? So we mm. identified Devonport in Tasmania, 25,000 people lived there. Um, the data was absolutely ringing off the, you know, the bell was the ding, ding, ding. This is right in the buying window for us as a company. It was showing all the signs, right? We'd done our due diligence, we'd been on the ground, we'd looked around it. Um, there were 110 properties on the market. We went on a deep dive of those properties. We made many phone calls to the agents because if they knew that professionals were interested in the market, they would change the way that they would think. They would talk to their principal at their office and say, I've just had this interesting call from someone on the mainland and they'll change the way they position properties. So I'd have very low sophisticated... I actually had people in, in the Philippines, believe it or not, um, making hundreds of phone calls to the real estate agents in Devonport over a two or three-week period. They might make six phone calls. I'd ring up and think... You know, pretend they don't even really know what's going on, but they'll get critical information about the tenant's uh, vendor sales agent relationship and if there was been access to the open homes or not. You know, stuff like that you have to get right into the, the weeds with. Um, yeah. We gathered all of this intelligence. We identified 40 or so properties that were our targets. We then had very coordinated negotiations on those 40. So I'm talking over the period of a week or so, we came in with very targeted professional negotiations um, three or four, so three bedroom homes in Devonport as a market were selling for around that three hundred thousand dollar price point. We bought, um, sorry, I'm just, I don't have the information. So twenty properties. We bought twenty properties in three weeks in Devonport. So of those forty or so properties we shortlisted, we acquired twenty of them instantly. We dragged the market down to us um, because they were pretty local real estate agents. They didn't really know the ways of the, the wider world, and we were professional negotiators. We came in and had a field day. We dragged those 20 properties down to 270 to 280,000. Um, and then what happened? Well, guess what? The data in this market, it, um, it was a very good market overall. There was lots of invest, uh, lots of buyer activity overall, lots of open homes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so with 20 less properties out of the market in two or three weeks, you had people piling into those ones that were left over. Now, and you would know this from a finance perspective as well, Aaron. If we kept buying there as professionals, we would suck the market down to us. As soon as our purchases become comparables, as soon as they settle and become comparables, that's the new normal. We've actually lowered the values in the area. But when we strategically come in and out, we've left the market. Um, people, are, you know, mums and dads are going to the open homes. There's less properties around. They go back to the bank. They get a vow done. None of ours is coming up on the vow reports they then go happily along and offer 300, 310, 320. And the moment they do, it sucks up all of our comparables to that number. Yeah. And we did it on mass, right? And so, and this just gives you some idea. Um, the moment we'd stopped buying there, I, you know, with Australian Property Investor Magazine and those types of connections and things, talk about Devonport. Guess what, guys? Devonport. Um, we've been, you know, all these wonderful things occurring in Devonport. Investors should take note. I called the local real estate agents, uh, sorry, the local newspaper, and I was on the front page of the newspaper, $6 million worth of property bought by the mainlanders, right? So as soon as we stop buying there as private advisory, we start the news cycle going, right? It's like a, a hedge fund or it's, you know, it's like a professional, um, it's, it's sophisticated investment. You know, you, you use yeah. the, the information cycle to your advantage, Um We've done that again. You know, we've tried it on, you know, cities now 10 times the size. We've done it on sort of full suburbs through, you know, we're in um, uh, Salisbury, local government area of Salisbury, and we did the same thing there um, in 2020, bought many properties very quickly and then spread the news cycle. So, um, yeah. uh, you know, when people are sometimes talking about areas uh, publicly, it's the motivations might be, you know, somewhat hidden and, and it's not a good thing or a bad thing. It's just... 
I'm buying there as well. My clients are buying there. So it's yeah. in our interest for property prices to go up, you know, and for and for vacancy rates to tighten. So um just yeah. for example, and this is one of the questions that I've got for you is there there are properties, so there are 40 properties in Davenport, for example, mm. but you bought 20 of them. So what made 20 make the cut and 20 not make the cut from your professional experience? Um, I've got a framework that we use and I call it the PUSH property framework. So, you know, it's another one of those acronyms, but the P stands for purchasing under market value. Um, this is a can of worms, you know, under market value truly does exist. Mm. If you have a very accurate picture of value and then you can negotiate under it. Um, so targeting these properties where we have profit on the entry is, is important. You know, I want to be making money out of the purchase and not the vendor, mm. uh, uplifting the property in value through renovation. Um, so over the years, you know, with my properties on the back of a, <laughs> you know, kitchens on the back of a trailer on the way up to um, Newcastle area, I know the stuff that you do to a property that, um, you know, improves the value of it cheaply. And I, I, you have to think of things in terms of a ratio. So if you're fixing leaky roofs or you've got structural issues, you might get a one-for-one -one return on your money spent. You might spend 15 yeah. grand on stumping, but it's only really adding what you paid for that stumping work. Yeah. If you do things like floating floorboards, painting walls, you've got a three or four times multiple in many cases, tidying up landscaping, simple stuff like that. Yeah. Kitchens, bathrooms, usually between two and three. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, COVID squeezed a lot of margin through this, but finding properties where um, have that uplift potential, staying away from from uh, structural. So of those properties, it has to be the right level of tired. You know, it can't be too well renovated or too new. It can't be too old and has those larger issues. No, yeah. That's a big part of it. And then you've got the synergies now starting to occur. So you might have more of an opportunity to purchase under market value with a property that's a little bit tired. Yeah. And the sales campaign may be a little bit compromised because, uh, you know, the area is really going forth. You've got you've young families and they want something that's fresh and clean. Right, so you've now got some leverage, and then you have this relationship where the S in push stands for surplus cash flow per annum. Right, so we don't want to be negatively geared. We don't want to be foregoing one dollar of profit so we can save thirty cents in tax. This is about a property earning the right to be in our portfolio. We're buying a business with a healthy balance sheet, is what I sort of generally say. So surplus cash flow is very important. Um, when you renovate a property, you're then maximizing the rent you can achieve from that property and generally you up the, the gross on cost yield that you achieve from it. You have cash in the bank. Um, so those three do work together quite well. And then the H stands for high performance growth. My expectation is uh, I'm entering into a market where I've controlled those variables and I outperform the average. Um, this is not, uh, you know, this is not advertising. It's not a sales pitch, but when you think of things in when you achieve the growth, right? If if you wanted the best hundred year growth in Australia, you'd probably go to Point Piper or to to you know eastern suburb city. You know they're worth fifty million dollars for a reason because they've had it above average capital you know compounding growth. Yeah. When you think about capital gains, and this is probably a really important takeaway, you have to think about when you would prefer the growth to occur. Is it on day one through to day? You know uh, year zero through to year two, or is it from year two through to mm. year five, or is it you know, stronger compounding growth over the longer term. Because when I'm building a portfolio, I'm looking for high performance, short to midterm growth, right? Zero to five years, I'm looking for areas that are really pushing forwards. And then if they fall back to the average, I'm okay with that. I've already made my above average returns. I can divest that into other things. Um, so it's that awareness of when the returns occurring and demanding because we are then picking our points in the cycle, we are demanding that we're entering into an upswing and not sitting around in the consolidation phase. So demanding that above average growth in the short term. Um, that's what I look for. You know, and then individual properties, I can run through a cheat sheet, but, um, you know, as a team, and so it's a funny environment that we're operating at the moment where um, we're having to look at many, many properties uh, and do due diligence on many, many properties for that due diligence to be wasted because, yeah. you know, we don't have the leverage in a negotiation. We walk away with, with that wastage. So, um, you know, we have to be very forceful with our checklists. We can't just go, you know, it, it's, it looks all good, but this one little point here um, is not going to work. So it's close enough, it's good enough. It has to be perfect. And, there's a, you know, there's some really easy ones probably to answer your question around, um, generally rectangle shaped blocks, less gradient, less slope, you know, noise, main roads, but then also, uh, you know, is the noise traveling from the main road? Are you one street away, but it's still yeah. impacted? 
Um, yeah. We've had some interesting ones lately. We're getting a little bit funny with power lines. Yeah. Um, some high high voltage power lines over in WA, um, very different to what I'm used to here in Tassie. They actually look like traditional power lines, but they're extremely high voltage. So if you've got to get a loan within 50 metres of those, you're going to have issues. Yes. Yeah, um, you know, there's a lot of gotchas like that um, that you probably got to tick the boxes. Maybe the one thing, just the one takeaway is usable floor space. Um, people paying extra and getting a four bedroom um, in the area, thinking that's going to hit the you know the market between its eyes. But then you know the bedrooms are all very small, and there's only one large living area. Where there's a three bedroom next door that has large bedrooms and three living areas. You know, you're not you don't need to pay a premium for that four bedroom when you can potentially come in and buy the three bedroom at a similar price uh, or less because it's a three bedder and it's perceived differently. Just that understanding of, of usable floor space. Is there a hallway right down the middle of the house and it's taking off each of the rooms and the size of them? Um, is there laundries? You know, some of these old, older constructs, are there laundries that are this? I saw one the other day that was three and a half by about, oh, was it, it was over three by three. It was three and a half by 3.2 so meter laundry. I was like, you can turn that into a bedroom. Exactly. Yeah. yeah so these sort of got this, you know, yeah. you've got to, these guys, you know, to do this yourself, um, there's no shortcuts. Please, by all means, do it yourself. But you've got to literally look at hundreds and hundreds of properties and look at and think about things, digest it. You know, get a bottle of wine and actually think about what it's like to rent or live in these homes. And then you'll start to see uh, what buying pools would see value for it. And and you've got to think of it in terms of if a property is compromised in its buying pool, you know, like a duplex, right? A duplex, great yield, two entries, you know, you've got two leases. Excellent yield, but if you were ever to sell that duplex, it's only ever going to be an investor that would buy it. So then, therefore, you've got a whole raft of owner occupiers that wouldn't buy it. Your buying pool has been decreased. That's going to compromise your ongoing growth. Um, doing a lot of talking, guys. I, 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 no, that's why. That's why we wanted you. On here. <laughs> that's why we wanted you on here. That's probably why we're going to get you back, Jacob, is because it just kind of rolls off your tongue. So much knowledge. You want to see investors do all your hearts in the right place, and that's why I want to say. Thank you. Thank you for the way that you show up and thank you. I know that you're not 100%, so thank you very much. And this is you, not at 100%, we'll get you back when you're firing on all cylinders. Um, that's why I want to say thank you for thank you for the work you're doing. Thank you for Ripe House and sharing your knowledge with us today. I really appreciate it. What we are going to do is if anyone wants to connect with Jacob, his team, and check out Ripe House, we'll include all the details to, to his team and their, and their website as well so you can do your own due diligence, do your own research and find out if it's the right fit for you and you and, uh, on your portfolio building journey as well. But thank you very much, Jacob. We'll, um, we shall be in touch and appreciate your time. My pleasure. Thank you so Great. much. That's a wrap for another episode of the Australian Property Investment Podcast. I've been your host, Aaron Christie-David. Until next time, take care and we'll chat soon.